From year to year, month to month, week to week, and day to day, people across the world are obsessed with a phenomenon that is professional wrestling. But why? 101 Reasons to Love Professional Wrestling There are many components of professional wrestling that should be both understood and celebrated, in no particular order. The Ref Bump All organized competition enforces rules and regulations. This keeps the contest fair and sets the standard in terms of how to win. To achieve this objective, a judge or official will oversee the contest. Their job is to enforce the rules and maintain the honor of the game. Baseball has umpires, basketball has referees, and boxing and UFC has both referees and judges. In most cases, these figures should become part of the background of the spectacle. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes a ref is so intertwined in the game, they fall victim to the physicality of sports. No one should want to see someone really get hurt. But there's always a collective love for seeing a referee get wiped out, a referee taking a baseball to the nether regions, or really any time a ref takes a hit. In professional wrestling, this is the ref bump. In wrestling, it happens fairly often, and we fans love every minute of this storytelling contraption. The battle inside the wrestling ring gets to the boiling point that it's inevitable that the ending is coming. The energy in the air is electric, and every emotion imaginable has been expressed. Then a move gets reversed. Someone gets whipped into a corner, or someone lands from a big move, and the referee gets in the way. The referee takes a fall, leaving the match without an official. This allows for the story to go in various iconic directions that longtime fans are well familiar with. The heel may take advantage of this situation and cheat with a weapon or low blow. Someone from the outside could interfere and attack a rival, an attempt of physical punishment and to control the outcome. Or the face overcomes the obstacle afoot. They dodge the weapon. They take out the outside interference. And they have their foe down for a three count. The crowd erupts with a blaring silence. They know the ref is still out. The face is both panicked and a rocket of momentum. They slap the mat and count to three themselves as the crowd chants along. The face has no choice but to give up their pinning position and tend to the fallen ref. In some cases, another referee will run down to the ring and replace them. Then out of nowhere, the heel rolls up the anxious inertia that is the face. The ref is somehow magically alert and counts one, two, then whatever happens next. This ring ritual is one of the oldest tropes in the art form used to tell a story. You can knock down a referee, hit someone with a chair, and then cover up your opponent. Then out of nowhere, the referee will magically wake up and count to three. You don't get those kind of theatrics just anywhere. If it's done wrong, then of course it looks bad. But if it's done right, it's one of the best and truest tricks to pull to truly antagonize the emotion of the crowd. Fantasy Booking There has always been a sense of nobility in predicting the future based on both predetermined patterns and absolute creativity. Nostradamus made very poetic in what some would consider a little too coincidental predictions about the future. The great intellectuals have all had their thoughts on where either the world was headed or where they would like to see it go. Meteorologists predict when it's going to rain based on patterns and facts. A psychic will tell you the future based on unknown factors. When you're a fan of sports, it's likely you fall somewhere in between weatherman and psychic. The nickname for sport fans that predict the future 
and criticize the past are armchair quarterbacks. Fans will boast their so-called expertise and express how things should turn out before it happens. The concept of fantasy booking in wrestling goes beyond just thinking of what would be a fun dream match to watch. Sometimes we fans enjoy an exhilarating discussion of fantasy booking. In professional wrestling's glory days, the storylines were never written by Hollywood writers. It was done by a booker or booking committee. The booker decides on what happens, the direction of the characters, stories, and championship reigns. In the entertainment world, this is akin to fan fiction. It's when super fans take an existing creative property, including existing characters, and the existing world that has been created to write out their own hypothetical plots. It's a tribute to the creative world of television, cinema, or in this case, professional wrestling. Fans of wrestling know their ideas will rarely ever be considered. This is mostly because those who present wrestling already have their own ideas and their own vision of how they want wrestling to be seen. It's kids on a playground, fans at an independent show, fans at a WWE show, older folks, writers, casual fans, other wrestlers, and even celebrities. Everyone has their own version of what they think wrestling should be. It's a testament of passion and one of the most popular and best forms of discussions a fan can have. You can let your mind wander through the hypothetical big matches, the what ifs, and come up with your own fantasy scenarios. And these armchair bookers get to do this every single week as new programming is being pumped out by the biggest promotions. Any longtime fan of wrestling will be able to tell you their dream matches or what they'd want to do if they could write the storylines themselves. When the storytellers in wrestling accomplish their goal, fans get lost in the moment and react accordingly. Then as soon as the brain processes this new reality, those aforementioned what ifs are sure to follow. Surprise pins. The underdog has always had their moments of overcoming the roadblocks in front of them. In literature, Robin Hood defeats the Sheriff of Nottingham. Dark Horse underdogs have become president. Movies about overcoming the odds have actually overcame their own odds and won Oscars. These dark horses have won professional sport championships and are embedded in our collective rooting spirit. In professional wrestling, the dark horse, the underdog, the one-time faceless nobody, occasionally jolts the world. Wrestling has a common trend of finishing matches the same way. It's almost always a big finishing move and then the winner gets the pin. Sometimes they'll stall for dramatic effect, but it's almost always like this. The surprise and surprise pins is a reaction due to the winner being very unexpected. Be it a schoolboy or small package, a wrestler will quickly get the pin and stun the opponent, the announcer, crowd, and often themselves. It's rare, but still common to see the underdog get the quick win. But there's other contraptions in this feature of professional wrestling fandom. It could be a debut of someone that many would not take very serious. But there have been tons of examples of big debuts with surprising results. There have been a plethora of surprise pins in modern wrestling. Barry Horowitz earned a slap on the back for defeating the overly cocky heel, Skip, in 1995. Also in 1995, longtime lovable jobber Mikey Whipwreck actually defeated Steve Austin in ECW before Austin would move on to become Stone Cold in the WWF. In 2003, The Rock would get upset by the Hurricane of all people. Then there was the established tag team wrestler and future ring general Shelton Benjamin defeating a very surprised Triple H on a Raw in 2004. Occasionally, a surprise pin doesn't involve an underdog, but rather just a purely unexpected result. 
The biggest shock and awe of a surprise pin occurred at WrestleMania 30 when Brock Lesnar defeated The Undertaker and ended his winning streak of over 20 years. No one would ever have expected Jinder Mahal to defeat Randy Orton, that alone defeat him for the world title. But when we're talking about surprise pins, there is only one that goes down in history as one of the most shocking and most career making. In May of 1993, Razor Ramon would take a quick pin from a young skinny guy with a wet mullet. This was the episode of Monday Night Raw that established the 123 Kid as a mainstay in the mainstream. It can't happen all the time, but when a surprise pin does, it's always a fun shock to the system and creates many memories. The Exposed Turnbuckle A professional wrestling ring is typically constructed the same way every time. Similar to a boxing ring, the poetically dubbed squared circle is 16 to 20 feet squared with four ropes connected to four corner posts. Each of the 12 rope corners are connected to said corner post with an eye hook, also called a turnbuckle. Each of these 12 turnbuckles are wrapped with a turnbuckle pad, a soft covering to protect the wrestlers from colliding with exposed steel. Sometimes the padding is removed by an opportunist looking to illegally gain the upper hand in a match. And this is the phenomenon of the exposed turnbuckle. It's addition via subtraction in a very bizarre way. A top turnbuckle pad is accidentally removed or straight up ripped off by the bad guy. When one cannot find a chair or sneak in a foreign object, the exposed turnbuckle is easily accessible by merely untying it from the post. Then there's an oh so suspenseful cat and mouse game where there's that inevitable moment of someone's head connecting with the raw steel of the exposed turnbuckle. Sometimes a scoundrel who ripped the pad off will succeed in getting the good guy's head to collide and then the three count victory to follow. There are also those moments where the villain's evil plans backfire. Being outwitted or a move reversed, it's their cranium that crashes into the exposed ring construct. Whichever competitor takes the steel hit to the dome typically loses, lights out. This has been going on for decades. It's as historic as a rake to the eyes or a low blow and has been another fun way for wrestlers to tell their in-ring story. Andre the Giant would start his match with Jake the Snake Roberts by launching his head into the exposed buckle at WrestleMania 5. But its roots go back deep into the territory days of old. It always seems to pop up at WrestleMania events like WrestleMania 11, when Psycho Sid removed it on Shawn Michaels' behalf, only for the Heartbreak Kid to still end up losing to the champion, Diesel. This would happen many more times, including WrestleMania 32, when Callisto retained the United States Championship over Ryback after the pad was ripped off and it went to his advantage. It just always seems to pop up when watching old matches, and still to this day, on new programming. The storytelling contraption of an exposed turnbuckle doesn't occur in every match, or even every show, but when it does, it achieves the goal of working up the crowd into a justice-seeking frenzy. Reinvented character. Cultures change, people change, the world itself as we know it changes. When this occurs, one has two choices, adapt or watch it pass you by. Actors will change their look and character performance for each role they land. An athlete 
might switch jersey numbers or add some questionable tattoos to change up their appearance. The persona that connects to art can get a little more creative to meet the visual demands of the audience. Musicians do this all the time. Rock star icons like David Bowie went from human to alien to whatever he wanted. The Beatles went from clean cut mop tops to hippies and even Elvis went from a standard 50s garb to sequin capes and jumpers. Of course, there's the likes of Madonna or Lady Gaga switching it up and keeping their pop star images interesting and a talking point. Change is never a bad thing. It allows a reset, an opportunity to stay interesting, new visuals to sell merchandise, and a chance to engage the crowd in a new way. In professional wrestling, this can easily happen with a reinvented character. A reinvented character can be a renaissance of a performer's career, or just another destination on their journey. Sometimes an act will get stale or just never connect with the crowd. What will sometimes happen is these people will get a second chance. The performer gets to re-debut as a new repackaged character or come back with a refreshed version of what's already been established. And the character-driven performance that is professional wrestling thrives on renovation, evolution, and capturing the imaginations of its viewers. A reinvented character is a proven way to accomplish this. Sometimes it's as simple as evolving from lower card to the main event. Steve Austin was stunning and the ringmaster long before becoming Stone Cold. Triple H went from a Connecticut snob to a cerebral assassin on his way to becoming a multi-time world champion. Glenn Jacobs would portray various characters before the WWF but he would also play various characters in the WWF. He started as an evil dentist named Isaac Yankum before moving on to a fake version of Diesel and then finally the former world champion and Undertaker's brother, Kane. And now he's a mayor in Tennessee. Certain characters do work but also don't meet the expectations or needs of a wrestling company story. Freshening up is vital in these cases. Hulk Hogan wrote out his all-American red and yellow character for years on the highest level a wrestler could. To rejuvenate his character, he turned on the fans and embraced a new Hollywood Hogan persona. Bray Wyatt came in as a Southern cult leader and has renovated his character into the bizarre fun that is the Firefly Funhouse and the horror monster of Fiend. Sting started off as a colorful face painting surfer for the early part of his career before striking gold by copying the movie The Crow and then striking cold with ripping off the Joker in TNA. Mick Foley was Cactus Jack, Mankind, Dude Love, and eventually just himself. Then there's those who never quite make it to the top of the card, but celebrate longevity because of their ability to get different characters over with the crowd. Charles Wright started off as Papa Shango in the early 90s and would go on to be the supreme fighting machine, Kama, before developing his most beloved character, The Godfather. Scott Hall was one of the best of all time and is definitely a Hall of Famer. But he grew from the Diamond Stud in AWA to Razor Ramon in the WWF. And then the NWO version of Scott Hall in WCW. Chris Jericho has pretty much always been Chris Jericho. But he has changed his character up every couple of years to remain fresh and extend his already legendary career. The same could be said for Matt Hardy, Dustin Rhodes, Raven, Barry Darso, and many others who have continued to hone their craft inside the ring while reinventing their personas. Just about everyone in professional wrestling 
that has had a long career has changed their on-screen character up to stay relevant. A character has to resonate with the audience or serve a purpose. The facade of a wrestler is essential to the business. Super cards. Big events are nothing new in the world of sports. The NFL has the Super Bowl. The NBA has the finals. Baseball has the World Series. Soccer has the World Cup. And the entire world has the Olympics. Professional wrestling has super cards. These are highly promoted and highly anticipated shows that feature big rivalries coming to a head, historic championship matches, and the largest crowds of rabid fans that have been waiting for these shows to come. Super cards go back to the early days of professional wrestling. There was always the big payoff for big matches that would often lead to big events at big venues and sometimes even baseball stadiums. When wrestling began to become a televised production, it was safe to predict that televised super cards were on the way. In 1983, Jim Crockett's NWA would unleash Starcade. This show would feature a gigantic matchup between the nature boy Ric Flair and the legendary Harley Race inside of a steel cage. Thousands of fans would fill the Greensboro, North Carolina arena and thousands would watch from home. This tradition would continue for decades as Starcade would be the biggest show for Crockett's promotion and then WCW. More supercards would be added to the calendar that fans could and would look forward to for months. Then pay-per-view became a thing. The people at home could pay a fee and tune in from the comfort of their own couch from anywhere in the world. With this, the concept of WrestleMania took the crown of the king of supercards. Since the early 1980s, the WWF and then the WWE have held their annual supercard. WrestleMania has become the Super Bowl of professional wrestling, and rightfully so. This spectacle has featured the biggest stars in the biggest of matches in front of the biggest of crowds. Even if someone doesn't know anything about wrestling, they know that WrestleMania is a big deal. It's just one of those universal events. The fact that the carny business of wrestling has evolved and built up an event so much that they can draw over 80,000 people, sell millions on pay-per-view, and virtually control an entire major city for one weekend, says a lot. The grandiose awe of supercards is not reserved for the history of WWE and WCW. Extreme Championship Wrestling, Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, and now All Elite Wrestling have all presented their own supercards. And it doesn't end with America-based promotions. Mexico, Japan, and elsewhere have all held their own annual supercard events. Fans of professional wrestling are fortunate to be able to form their own memories with any given show. But it is the supercards that the collective memories and moments that bring us together are made. And they also make our favorite promotions a lot of money. It's something to look forward to. It's a platform for legends to be made. It's both the end of a chapter and the start of a new. It's a super card, and it's an event you never want to miss. Auto Destruction The Ford Model T, the first mass-produced automobile, was launched in 1908. This innovation would have a large impact on society as we know it. With personal cars came trucks and other modes of transportation. With the growth of automobiles, auto racing became a global pastime. Spectators would watch to see who would win the race, but at the same time, the shock and awe of a big crash is what many would be talking about the following day. 
this strange fascination would evolve into monster truck rallies, where gigantic trucks would ram into each other, run over junk cars, and totally embrace the automotive carnage that fans would cheer for. Then there are demolition derbies, where old cars are, well, demolished. If fans of anything are cheering, of course, professional wrestling is listening. And since wrestling has seen its share of automotive destruction, brawling in a parking lot is a thing of old. When you're fighting around thousands of pounds of potential carnage, that potential was often reached. During the Attitude Era, the WWE would see more auto destruction than the worst of winter pileups. Whether it was Stone Cold Steve Austin filling Vince McMahon's fancy Corvette with cement in 1998, Stone Cold Steve Austin running over The Rock's new car with a monster truck in 99, or even Stone Cold Steve Austin blowing up the DX Express by dropping a steel beam on it in 2000. Auto destruction was here to stay. And that was the bottom line because someone said so. WCW was no stranger to the auto destruction phenomenon at this time, as they had the White Hummer mystery, where said Hummer destroyed a limo where Kevin Nash was hanging out. In 2001, Triple H would total Undertaker's motorcycle with his trusty sledgehammer. In 2005, Batista would smash up JBL's limo. Then three years later, John Cena in Crime Time would also vandalize JBL's white limo. In 2007, Vince McMahon's limo would explode. Luckily, he didn't die or walk away with a scratch at all. We'll ignore that one. In 2009, Kobe Kingston would destroy Randy Orton's new race car with a tire iron and a bucket of paint. In 2017, Braun Strowman would lift and destroy an ambulance. It goes on and on, and will continue to do so. For some reason, it's become perfectly acceptable for any and all on-camera cars, trucks, limos, and modes of transportation to be vandalized. All of this to the roaring joy of the fans. Creature Features Everyone should have a spirit animal. This is an animal that one relates to and can focus on to gain energy, inspiration, or comfort. Fight Club saw Marla delve into the world of penguins. Donnie Darko was spoken to by Frank the Bunny. The Flintstones had a dinosaur, the Jetsons a dog, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch had a talking black cat. It would be hard not to feel empowered by the majesty of a soaring eagle. It would be unheard of to not love a cute and cuddly panda. It would be nonsense to hate on someone for loving their dog. Animals are part of nature, and so are we. There are a plethora of domesticated animals that we welcome into our homes and welcome into our hearts. A professional wrestler might be larger than life, big and bad, and with a presence to them that leaves those they encounter in speechless awe. But at the end of the day, they are still human and part of the greater nature that is our ecological society. This means professional wrestlers will not shy themselves from presenting their own creature features. Jake Roberts was a wrestler from Georgia, but Jake the Snake Roberts is a legend. With his snake Damien, Jake ate up the scenery in the 1980s. The tag team British Bulldogs not only used Bulldogs as their gimmick, but brought out their own widow cuddly Bulldog in Matilda. A man named Coco Beware sounds like a fun person just based off the name, but when you add a parrot named Frankie, the act goes from forgettable to Hall of Fame worthy. Ricky Steamboat is one of the most impressive and respected pro wrestlers of all time, but Ricky the Dragon Steamboat made it a lot easier to sell some shirts. 
animals are part of wrestling character gimmicks, going even beyond those who include the literal animal in their act. There was the junkyard dog, George the Animal Steel, the killer bees, and of course, Hawk and Animal of the Road Warriors, Stone Cold Steve Austin was nicknamed the Rattlesnake. Randy Orton is the Viper. There's a Rhino and even a Shark Boy. Professional wrestling is a lot like going to the zoo. You will see animals and creature features. And just like the zoo, you never want to see anyone escape from their cage. Managers. Fighters have had managers going back to the early days of organized combat. These business people would organize, promote, and take care of their fighter going in to the big matchup. Boxing managers are mentors, advisors, and guides that look out for the best interest of their fighter. And of course, since it's a business, they'd get their cut of the fighter's income. Jackie Callan would be one of the first and most successful female managers once she joined the ranks in the 1970s. We've seen this in movies as well. There's always a force behind the force. In professional wrestling, the role of a manager is similar, but a little different. A manager will walk to the ring with their wrestler and, depending on if they're good or evil, get involved. There have been iconic exceptions to the rule, but the role of a professional wrestling manager is often reserved for bad guys. This allows a heel that may not be as skilled on the microphone to have a mouthpiece that can help hype their status or matches. Then there are bodyguards who act as the heel wrestler's enforcer to give them a physical upper hand. Shawn Michaels had Diesel. The Four Horsemen had their own enforcer in the form of Arn Anderson. And Chris Jericho had Ralphus. Some of the greats have had a female valet at ringside to act as a distraction or to get their own hands dirty to ensure the underhanded victory. The Hall of Famers Sensational Sherry, Sonny Tammy Sitch, China, and a slew of others have carved their path taking this route. A manager may work with tag teams, and most certainly some of the greatest have. The most successful tag team manager of all time is undeniable. Jim Cornette, as polarizing as he is, is by far the most successful heel tag team manager. But he's not alone. Paul Ellering was the vocal background of the Road Warriors. Certain managers are a little more ambitious and take on a whole staple of wrestlers to assist and guide. Some of the best ever in the mouth from the South, Jimmy Hart, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and Paul Heyman have shared their services amongst a group of heels. They might be former wrestlers, huge fans, or just very skilled performers, but the persona of a professional wrestling manager definitely has its place. They are easy to hate, easy to boo, and easy to get the crowd invested. When they finally get their comeuppance, whether it be seeing their fighter lose, finally taking their deserved lickings, or just getting embarrassed, the crowd always goes home happy with a new memory. House Shows Long before televised productions, pay-per-views, and live streaming options, professional wrestling was a touring act. A stand-up comedian goes town to town telling the same jokes, and a band touring goes stage to stage, playing the same set list every night. The same script will be used every night when a play is being performed. Professional wrestling has more similarities to these traditions than many would think. 
tracing back to its traveling carnival and vaudeville act roots, professional wrestling would always make its rounds. With these unconnected shows, it was easy to put together an entertaining card. A wrestling promotion would showcase the same wrestlers in the same matches, with often the same results. Then on to the next town 100 miles away, with the same exact presentation. This was before the days of everyone being privy of every result that happens on any given night. These fans didn't know or care because the show right there in front of them was exciting and something to look forward to. This would result in wrestling feuds lasting for months and even years. And since the performers were facing off every night, they could put together a match that would entertain the audience more than a normal one-off. These shows were also a chance to have big title matches as advertised on the early studio wrestling shows. But times change. Televised productions, pay-per-views, and live streaming options on top of the internet providing more coverage than ever before. However, these house shows wouldn't be too far off. It would be common to see the same big main events night after night, the same mid-card matches, and the same copy and paste production. But there is still a magic to the modern day house show. You get to see the performers you watch on TV right before your very eyes. The good guys win, the bad guys lose, and the fans go home happy and yearning for the next live event experience. Then sometimes, the promotions throw a huge curveball at us. A championship match will not go as expected, and a new champion will be crowned. This is not something that is taken for granted. Sometimes contracts end, someone gets in real life trouble, or there's an internal decision that a change is needed, and it's needed despite the event not being televised. Bret the Hitman Hart's first title reign came after defeating Nature Boy Ric Flair at a house show in 1992. Diesel would defeat Bob Backlund for the WWF world title in 1994. Tag titles would swap around. Women's championships have switched. Mid-card titles like the WWE Intercontinental and WCW's television title would move on to new owners and back and forth. Even the NXT world title would change owners twice at house shows. It's these moments that turn a house show into an event for the history books. It's these moments that keep the anything can happen vibe alive. Of course, nine times out of 10, you're getting the same show from the same town before, but that's the magic of a professional wrestling house show. On any given night, an upset or surprise can happen. And that's what keeps us going back for more.